a city under siege. Get to the side. Hong Kong is facing its worst political turmoil since its handover from Britain back to China in 1997. Hong Kongers continue to take to the streets, protesting against China's tightening grip and the rights they say were promised under the law. For months now, demonstrators, young and old, have voiced their anger and frustrations, often resulting in violent clashes with police and alleged gang members. Pop star turned activist Denise Ho has become an emblematic figure of the pro-democracy movement, taking the fight to the world. China is preventing our democracy at all costs. This has come at a personal price, derailing her career and making her an enemy of the Chinese government. There is an amazing energy, is Yes, it? yes, yes. This month, we sit down with Denise Ho to talk about the long battle for democracy. This is only the beginning. The threat of Beijing using military force against protesters and the end game for Hong Kong. We have to have that mental preparation for this to be a very, very long fight. Denise Ho, welcome to Talk Asia. Hello. Thank you, Anna. You are one of the most prominent faces of the pro-democracy movement here in Hong Kong, uh, which have been having weekly, sometimes violent, uh, protests for the last few months. Tell me, what are you and the people of Hong Kong fighting for? We are fighting for our freedoms. Uh, we are fighting for the Hong Kong that we knew, the values that we had since we were growing up and also, of course, for uh, Hong Kong's autonomy, which is written and promised by the basic law, the one country, two systems principle that uh, was supposed to happen in 1997, but we are still not seeing that totally implemented in Hong Kong. Yeah. It began with the extradition bill, these most recent protests. They would have allowed anyone in Hong Kong charged with a crime to be extradited to mainland China, but it has become so much more. This is now a, yes. a fight for the, the future of Hong Kong. We had the Umbrella Movement, which the, was the first ever movement where Hong Kong people were standing up for themselves. That was five years ago, but it never really ended. All those disappointments and anger were still there and were not resolved and not talked about. It was almost like this sore that was festering beneath mm. the surface and yes, she scratched yes. the scab. Yes, yes, absolutely. You can see by the way that the people have come back, this is only the beginning of, of bigger protests and uh, the, the, this whole fight of the Hong Kong people for their own freedoms. Within these few months, we have understood that uh, the bigger problem lies within the communist government, they just do not understand uh, Hong Kong people. They, they don't understand our culture. They don't understand this diversity that exists between these two different species of people, I would say. Some protesters are calling for a revolution. Right. Is that what we are seeing? Is that what is happening right now? Among the younger generations, yes. I don't think they can see uh, the relationship you know, between Hong Kong and China as something that they can relate to, especially when uh, you have been given all these freedoms since you were born. The way that they are doing things in China is just, is just not uh, what we can accept. We have seen a, an escalation of violence on all sides, police, thugs, mm. protesters. Yeah. What does that represent to you? this aggression? Well, I think it's a very communist way, a uh, communist tactic to silence people. I don't believe that the thugs that, or, or the triads that have uh, 
appeared in Yunnan. I don't think they are really only doing it out of uh, the love of China. It's really you know, the, the fact that they can benefit from this Chinese market. And then, or maybe even you know, they are being paid to do certain actions. During the storming of the Legislative Council building on the 1st of July, many of the protesters involved felt they needed to take this sort of drastic action. I was among the crowds uh, on the day of the storming of the Legislative Council. And um, you know, to give some context, at that certain period of time, we had a few suicides. And so there was this very strong sentiment of despair where we had two million people on the streets and still we got no response. If the Legislative Council, the, that whole incident did not happen, it probably would have gone downhill from then because the international press would have lost interest. But how long do you think Beijing will put up with this civil disobedience on the streets of Hong Kong? I think that's a very complicated um, issue. On the surface, we are facing the Hong Kong government, but of course, you know, behind that is the Chinese government. And then within the, that government, there are the fight for power. So when there are such complicated issues involved, um, we cannot, first of all, we cannot compare it with what happened uh, in 1989 uh, with Tiananmen Square, where uh, you know, they deployed the, the, the army onto the people. I don't think that would happen anytime soon. But what is happening in Hong Kong must be highly embarrassing to, yes, to Xi Jinping. Yes, and that and to is his all government. the more why he cannot use the army, uh, not at this moment, because that really would be um, the end of one country, two systems, where uh, it, it is still something that, you know, even if, if it's completely eroded within itself, uh, China still wants, to, wants the world to believe that. Uh, it is working, especially they want Taiwan to believe that it is working. Last month, after more violent clashes on the streets of Hong Kong, Beijing issued a rare response to the ongoing turmoil. In a statement, China says the protests have damaged the rule of law, public order, the economy and lives in Hong Kong, as well as its international image. Beijing condemned what it called evil and criminal acts committed by the radical elements and praised the Hong Kong police for fulfilling their duties. Should the chaos continue, it is the entire Hong Kong society that will suffer. Earlier, after protesters defaced the Chinese national emblem at the Beijing liaison office in Hong Kong, the Chinese government stated it will not tolerate any challenges to the one country, two systems principle in which Hong Kong is governed. Civilised country with a large parliament being invaded in that way, uh, and uh, actually must be consequences uh, for those. Should the situation in Hong Kong deteriorate further into unrest, uncontrollable for the government of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, the central government would not sit on its hands and watch. We have enough solutions and enough power within the limit of basic law to quell any unrest swiftly. There was an insinuation that military force could be used. So I, I guess I ask you, you don't, you don't think that Xi Jinping would send the army onto the streets of Hong Kong? My gut feeling at the moment is no, I don't, th I don't think so. You know, you, you have to understand that the Chinese government, most of the time, they work on fear, you know, spreading fear onto the people and trying to get the people to retreat or self-censor. The reason I ask is because some commentators believe that what is taking place here in Hong Kong is reminiscent of the days in 1989 that led up to the Tiananmen Square massacre mm. in Beijing, yeah. that the Chinese government builds a case of untenable social disorder to then justify the use of martial law. Could that be happening? I really don't think that it would turn into something 
that is comparable to what happened you know, 30 years ago, especially when we have uh, the internet in our favor, where anything that happens uh, can be seen live. That is why they cannot use the same tactics and we cannot use the same uh, analytic way of thinking. It's just not comparable, I, I believe. You were born in Hong Kong, but you moved to Canada when you were 11 years old with your family. What prompted that move and, and how did that move shape your life? My parents chose to um, emigrate to Canada in 1988, just one year before the Tiananmen massacre. The joint declaration was signed in 84, and then there was this big wave of fear uh, among Hong Kong people and so people were scrambling to you know, try to leave the city because of uh, uncertainties. Ironically, I chose to come back to Hong Kong in 1997 uh, to pursue my singing career. Was Hong yeah. Kong always calling? I was always attached to the Hong Kong culture where, where whether it's the movies or you know, songs, Cantonese songs, Canto pop. My idol, my super idol, was a uh, canto pop diva, Anita Mui, who became my mentor in her late years. She was very, very outspoken against a lot of injustices that were happening in the society, namely the 89 Tiananmen massacre, speaking up for the Beijing students. And she actually was one of those who helped them flee the country later on. Before you got to that moment where you became involved in activism, yes. uh, did you feel that you were living your dream? Being a canto pop star, was, was yeah. that enough for you? Mm, probably not, probably not. For me, you know, I, I chased that recognition, I would say, for the first 10 years of my career. And then when I got to that point where, okay, I got the highest level of award for a female singer and then you know I was asking myself okay so what next which is something that is very different from most of the celebrities in you know, the Asian community where for them there is no end to this so-called success I started to think about how I can use this role to do more. And it just so happened that at that time, a lot of things came to me you know, on their own. Say, uh, in 2012, when I chose to come out uh, as a gay person, it wasn't a decision that just came to me like that. It happened because I saw injustices in our system. I, I realized that as a public figure or a celebrity, I had to be one of those who um, stepped up for th this minority. In 2014, you took part in the Umbrella Movement, calling for universal suffrage. You were arrested live on television. Was that a turning point in your life? Yes, it was. It was a very important moment. I realised that no, there really is more to uh, my role than just a singer singing for my own benefit. I guess you know, it's, it's a first awakening to this whole political scene where you realise that even if you are not you know, so-called politically involved, it would come to find you. Because by getting involved politically, you were jeopardising everything. You were certainly jeopardising your career. It was all at risk. Yes, but five years later, right now, I don't categorise that as a um, sacrifice. 
first of all, because I do think that I have gained more you know, from this experience than what I have given up. You know, I have given up a, a China market. Uh, you know, I have given up, no really, it's, it's just that. I have given up a China market, but I have and, and a lot of money and potential earnings. Well, but still, I can't earn money from that market. But I, it doesn't mean that I, I don't have a good revenue. Uh, sure, for yeah. sure. I guess it could have been so much more which is what so many other celebrities and kind of pop stars in Hong Kong do. Right. They are silent and they reap the rewards in China. Well, it's a more comfortable uh, revenue, I can say that. You know, sometimes when I think of it now, like say if I kept my mouth shut during the umbrella movement and then I kept a distance, would I be happy? And I think the, the obvious answer is no and that eventually, at some point, I would have had to, you know, I just have to say something. Well, the Chinese state media at the time called you a poison of Hong Kong. Uh, one editorial wrote, don't think you can eat our food and smash our pots at the mm. same time. They felt that you had betrayed China, that you certainly betrayed the Communist Party. Do you have any regrets? Of course, there are always challenges and difficulties, but you know, having this freedom really to say whatever you feel and to to just be yourself it is such a precious thing right now in hong kong Denise, why do you do this why, why do you come and take to the streets with everybody else well, it's really, I think, our right to protest in Hong Kong and to express our frustration against this government that is not listening to uh, the, the people. And uh, also, you know, because uh, we are really the only place in the whole China parameter that can do that. There is an amazing energy, isn't yes, there? Yes, yes. You feel it's your duty to come here? Yes, I do. Um, whether it's because I am a public figure, a celebrity, or even you know just as an adult, I think we do have the responsibility to uh, stand with the younger generations who are fighting so hard uh, against all these injustices that have been ignored for the previous few generations. So uh, I do believe that we have that responsibility to stand by them and to really to fight together as a community. So we might have differences even among the people who are standing on the streets, but uh, we have come to an understanding that uh, we can coexist. The Vienna Declaration guarantees democracy and human rights. Yet in Hong Kong today, these are under serious attack. In July, Hong Kong singer turned activist Denise Ho addressed the United Nations Human Rights Council about the unrest in Hong Kong. Police shot rubber bullets and 152 gas bombs. During her 90-second speech, she was interrupted twice by the Chinese delegate. Mr. President, the Sino-British Joint Declaration is a binding treaty registered with the UN. Yet after only 22 years, China is denying its obligations. The one country, two systems is nearing its death. Given its abuses, will the UN remove China from this Human Rights Council? Were you expecting that reaction? Yes. <laughs> to be really honest, I was expecting it. And at a certain level, I was trying to get them to interrupt me. How important was it to make this statement to the world? We are at this point where uh, the majority of the countries, they are choosing to stand side with uh, these tyrants, the, uh, that is you know, China, Russia, all those countries. And so I think we are at a point in history where it comes back to the people to speak up against all these issues because um, you know, the countries have their hands tied. And the other 
objective of that speech was to give hope to the Hong Kong people. Now, that was something that was very, very important for me. Do you think that the world cares about Hong Kong and what is happening here? More and more, I think. We saw this trending hashtag in Twitter these recent days, Pray for Hong Kong. I think that uh, people are starting to realise that this is not something that does not affect them. It, it is a global issue and then we are in face of the same um, authoritarian governments uh, and all the ridiculousness that is happening in the world. It is just one big issue. Are you satisfied with the responses from the, the UK, the US governments? I don't have high hopes uh, for the US president uh, you know, speaking up for human rights uh, for Hong Kong people. I don't think that is what is happening. Whereas the UK, I think they have tried um, you know, on several occasions. But of course, we always would hope that they can do more because this is in fact something uh, that is in the responsibility of the United Kingdom where they have this agreement between them and China. Denise, it feels like there is no end in sight regarding these protests. Do you feel the same? I'm trying to keep an open mind on what might happen. What I tell the people these days is that we have to have that mental preparation for this to be a very, very long fight. It could take months or even years or tens of years, but then it could also happen, happen tomorrow. You know, that is something that is giving me hope. And that is the beauty of you know, these movements where there is always hope. You know, I, I still believe in that. Even though we are in face of this giant machine that is China, the year 2047 is when Hong Kong officially returns right. to uh, China. That may feel like a long way away, but in actual fact, mm. it's not. What do you believe will happen to the city that you love come 2047? I don't think anyone can answer that question. Even um, people in power in China, in, in the Chinese government, the, the momentum is still going on. And quite obviously, it is something that has been very unexpected for the communist government. You know, Hong Kong people fighting strong. But you are here for the long fight. Yes, yes. For the people. Denise Ho, pleasure to meet you. No, thank you. Thank, thank you, Edna.